The following episode, episode 231 with Rob Hahn, was recorded in early March. It's for that reason that we do not discuss the coronavirus pandemic as it had not escalated to the level that it is now at that time. I felt it necessary to let you, the listener, know. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Sessions and enjoy the episode. What I would love to see the MLSs do, and all 550 of them, whatever, I would love to see all of them go private, not be not for profit. You know, all of them go private. And I've, I've been engaged in this whole privatization initiative since like 2010 and just start buying each other up and go raise capital because you can't go raise any money if you're a not for profit. You can't go raise any money if you're, even if you're a quote, for profit MLS, and there are a number of them, but your bylaws specifically state we're going to run as a nonprofit. You're listening to The Real Estate Sessions. I'm your host, Bill Risser. Listen in as I interview leaders in our industry, getting their stories and their journeys to the world of real estate. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 231 of The Real Estate Sessions podcast. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and for telling a friend. It's how we continue to grow. And today on episode 231, I get to talk to another rabble rouser, another pot stirrer, uh, the, the person who likes to just kind of contrarian maybe comes to mind. So we'll, I think you might know who I'm talking about already if you heard that laugh in the background, but uh, I'm going to be talking to Rob Hahn. Rob Hahn's the, uh, the founder CEO of 70S Associates. Um, Rob's got an amazing background and some great stuff. And I don't know if Rob remembers this, but about 10 years ago, he tweeted out that he was flying into Sky Harbor and said, hey, anybody around want to pick up some dinner? And I just went ahead and replied. I didn't really know Rob that well at the time. And he uh, he let me pick him up at the hotel and we went and got some pizza in on Mill Ave in Tempe. So Rob, welcome to the podcast. And do you remember that dinner? Thank you, Bill, for having me. And uh, of course, I remember that. You know, that was the introduction to Mellow Mushroom, you know, and I That's didn't right. know anything about that. You know, I guess it's now a chain. I don't know if it was back then, but I remember thinking, damn, Tempe's got some legit pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and good beer list. And know, a good beer list, I think, remember? I, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I got to tell you, I'm a pizza snob. So I think it's saying something to say that Mellow Mushroom got it going on. You know? <laughs> That's great. I like that. I like that. First things first, I have no idea where I'm talking to you. Like, First of all, you've relocated quite a few times in the last right. 10 years. So where are you at now and where do you live now? I live in Las Vegas now. I'm in the desert. I'm okay. in Sin City. Loving it. You know, I never thought I would say that. Uh, but then again, I, I never thought I would live north of 14th Street in Manhattan. So so there's that. Um, yeah. But I think this is home. I think we found it. Would you consider yourself a bit of a gambler? Not, not at all, actually. I don't think okay. you can live in this town if you have a gambling problem. I, I just don't know how. That was my question. How do you do it? I, you know, like I, I don't mind uh, rolling dice the craps table, you know, once in a mm -hmm. while. But uh, we've been here since June of last year. I have yet to actually do any gambling. I mean, I like it. You know, the action's cool and all. But yeah, for whatever reason, I have an addictive personality, but that's one I don't have a problem with. So yeah, there's no way to live here. I mean, come visit. You know, it's like once in a, once a year, I'm going to go to the tables. That's one thing, man. If you live here and you have a gambling thing, I don't, I don't know how you could live here. I just don't. Right. right. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that this wanderlust that you have is probably ingrained in you at a young age, right? You, <laughs> Mom and dad got an early start for you there because yeah. you, if I, if my stats are right, you moved to the U S from Korea as a child, right? That's right. When I was nine years old. In okay. 1980. So what did that look like? What, where did you move to? And gosh, uh, I think we first moved to New Haven. Because, you know, the reason why we ended up moving was my dad uh, got into the graduate program at Yale, at Divinity School. So we all moved. And then from there, because, you know, I like we didn't speak the language. It was all new. So we moved to Chicago for a little bit where my um, mom's sisters were, you know, and then it just moved around. You know, then like, growing up as a PK, that's pastor's kid, right? Preacher's kid. Yeah, you move, you know, whatever, wherever the church sends you, because you know my parents were United Methodist minister or were, right? They're retired now, you know, so they went wherever the the church sent them. It wasn't like the local church got to decide. So I'm going to say I moved every year and a half to two years, you know, from third grade, fourth grade up till graduating high school. So, so even yeah. in high school, that's a tough age to be moving around. You had yeah. to experience that as well. Which oh yeah, in life probably is a good thing. 
You know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. But I, I think about it sometimes, like how much that influenced my personality. Like, you know, I make friends pretty easily, right? You know, you're forced to be a little bit more social. But then again, like, I don't know what it's like, you know, to, to like grow up with people, right? Like I, I have, I have some, some envy for like Sunny, you know, uh, my wife, Sunny, you know, for the people who don't know, like she grew up in the same house, you know, the, her whole life until she left for college. So she has friends that she went to like kindergarten with, and I have no idea what that's like. Right. So, so I don't know, you know, I think it's, it's helped and hurt probably in some ways, right. You know, like all things. I, I use the word contrarian in the uh, intro. Is that yes, sir. safe, safe to call you a contrarian? I, I, you know, I, I guess it has to be right. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about, about, uh, about the industry and what I kind of discovered when I first started is just sort of telling things like how you see it. You know, I mean, I'll say the truth because I consider it to be true, but, you know, other people, you know, may not see things as the truth. But well, like, I like just simply speaking your mind sometimes can be contrarian because there's just a, such an investment in in um, in appearance. I guess I'll, I'll put it that way. Right. Because, yeah. you know, when you think about it and, and I come to really peace with it, I've come to terms with it over the years. You know, this is an industry that's built for by and of salespeople. And in sales, appearance and marketing is super important. You don't, you know, you don't want to uh, to go against that, right? At times. So, I guess I'm a contrarian because I just sort of call it like I see it. And as I'm as I'm happy to say in all my things, you know, I'm happy to be wrong. You know, <laughs> like I'm super happy to be wrong, but I'm not going to. I'm not super happy to kind of, you know, toe the, the, the politically correct line or the corporate line or, or whatever, right? Because I don't see the value in that, right? especially in my job. You know, I'm a consultant. That's my day job. I, I just don't understand the point of having a client pay you for your opinion and then telling them what they want to hear as opposed mm-hmm. to what you believe to be true. So, yeah, over the years, I think I've become, you know, the pot stirrer, the contrarian, all those things. I'm like, I don't... I, I, so let me tell a little story about it. like the first time I ran into this was, gosh, like the second year, maybe I started my blog, right? I just threw up a post and just offhandedly just kind of mentioned, right, that brokerage brands didn't matter. And I mentioned it because like every broker, every agent I'd been talking to, and I was already in the, in the uh, industry at the time, you know, was saying the brokerage brand doesn't matter. It's about your personal brand. Right. Everyone was saying that. So I'm like, well, you know, it, it wasn't I wasn't even saying it to be controversial, to be contra- I, I just kind of mentioned it. And oh, my God, like the comment section blew up, you know, emails blew up and all this. Stuff. I'm like, what? Like, I don't even understand this. Like, you know, like one of the commenters had literally told me, you know, like two weeks before that. Yeah. Brokerage brand doesn't matter. It's all about personal brand. And all of a sudden the comments are like, oh, brokerage brands matter. And <laughs> I, I, so you know, it's it. That was my first kind of run in with it, right? right? So it's it's. I've been blessed, you know. I'll say that somehow, you know, I've gotten a particular niche, right? You know, in the uh, in sort of the real estate commentary, as I, as I say it, um, yeah. it's one that I think I have to be pretty good at because, yeah, because I just like to call it like I see it and uh, let the chips fall there where they may. You know, I'm just not interested in being a politician. I guess you know. That's that's a that's a great segue to this next question. Yeah, um, you you went to Yale. I did, and and then got a law degree from NYU. I did. So that's that screams to me entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or a corporate attorney. You're going to be one or, or the other, or a massive debt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. As I like okay. to say, I, I mean uh, my degrees, I think, are the size of a really decent mortgage. You know. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so here's the interesting thing. Um, we have a saying at, at Yale, and I don't know if it's still there. It was, you know, it was uh, what we talked about, you know, when I was there, which is that you go to Harvard if you want to run the world. Okay, You go to Yale if you want to change the world. So, I've, you know, I guess that's kind of how I, I saw things, you know, um, and I went to Yale to be a playwright. You know, uh, I was very, very, very involved in student activism. You know, I guess uh, you could say I was one of those student radicals, uh, you know, as to tell people I was a straight Marxist in college, you know, those those types of things. So, yeah, I, I never thought I would go down that corporate law route. I never thought I would go to law school. You know, like I never thought any of those things uh, until it actually happened. You know, <laughs> never right. thought I would live in Las Vegas. Never thought I would live, 
in the South, you know, never thought any of those things, but you know, I was 19 and stupid. So, you know, what are you going to say? So, yeah, I, I think the entrepreneur thing probably started pretty early. I have a very distinct memory of being in junior high school, seventh grade, I think it was. And, you know, you know how schools have these like fundraising competition type deals where you sure. sell whatever. And this was, no, it wasn't even junior high school. This was fourth or fifth grade, right? So I wasn't even fully like speaking English, right? But my school had this thing where you had to sell Christmas candles, right? These, uh, and this was in 1984, something like that. So, you know, you go door to door and then they're like, hey, if you sell whatever this many candles, you get this bike. And I wanted that bike. So I went door to door, I think through the entire like town, you know, <laughs> and uh, came in second. I, I don't know oh. how I came in second. I think I sold like 900 candles. I mean, some crazy. And I don't know how the winner beat me. Uh, you know, it had to be like a group purchase. Like, you know, maybe you're... <laughs> Her dad was like the vice president of some local company. It was like, everyone buy a candle. You know? mm-hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, that I did that. I, I've always been involved in some weird things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just kind of happened that way. When you uh, finish school mm-hmm. completely. Yeah. Uh, you do you do a lot of, you do some different things before real estate comes along. Do you mind yes, just kind of doing a quick hit on that? Yeah, because it's in my bio. Let's see. I've been a Wall Street. I've been on Wall Street. Worked at a hedge fund. I've been a tech guy. Uh, I was a. I worked at Bergdorf Goodman, which is my favorite work experience. So I was selling men's suits. Uh, I was a professional card player, professional gamer. I guess I was a lawyer, you know. Uh, and then you know worked in various big companies, and then uh, been what, what what I'm doing since 2009. So I, I I'll ask this question: Would yeah. you consider yourself kind of a like a sci-fi geek, a gamer nerd? Completely. Is that you or is that? No, oh. completely. Totally. Okay, good. Although, you know, well, like- over, over time, I've gone more away from hard sci-fi, which I used to really enjoy, uh, into much more of the fantasy realm. So I'm in more of the fantasy side of sci-fi than like the starship side of sci-fi. Although gotcha. I, do, I do really enjoy the starship side of sci-fi as well. Yeah. More, you're more Game of Thrones now than Star Wars? Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have this uh, whole whole thing I go on about Star Wars. Like it's not really sci-fi, it's fantasy, you know, because there, there's so many things that just don't make any sense about Star Wars, you know? Like, I'll give you an example. Like, lightsabers deflect laser blasters, right? Yes. Okay, so why aren't they making body armor out of lightsabers? Right? I don't know, Rob. That's... Yeah. That's amazing. Why don't right. they? Why don't they? There's a scene in Empire Strikes Back where, uh, where I think it's Luke Skywalker. You know, he uh, he cuts open. You know, one of those giant at at walking things. He yeah. cuts it open with his lightsaber. I'm going, okay. If 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 that could defeat that armor, why wouldn't it just shoot lightsabers at these damn things? Right. <laughs> I, you're making way too much sense. You're going to make my so head explode. Yeah, it's I, things like that that uh, that uh, you know, like I make my kids laugh about it. And, you know, we're, so yeah, we're, re- <laughs> we're recording this. We're recording this on a Monday. <laughs> Yesterday, Sunday, I actually obtained uh, a spot in the virtual queue for the Rise of the Resistance okay. over in Orlando. Wow, nice. It is. I can't even say a word about it because I don't want to be a that spoiler person, but. If you're anywhere near Orlando, yeah, take the time and energy to get in that queue and go experience that. Uh, All right, that that ride, yeah, it's All really right. really cool, especially if you like uh, Star Wars. So I will. There's my my quick. Uh, Public yeah. service announcement. And, okay. and, and all I want to say is if anyone from Disney is listening, I think you might want to sponsor the Bill Risser show. I'm just saying. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, we'll see how that goes. So kind of not to turn this to a downer really quick, but. Um, 9-11 changed a whole lot of lives in this country That's right. and it, it had a direct impact on, on, on your career as well. And we'll That's talk right. About that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a, uh, it's a post I put up and I, I reposted every anniversary of 9-11. Mm-hmm. Um, make a real long story short, you know, I was working at USA Networks. I was the general manager for uh, sci-fi.com. I left that because I decided the, the Hollywood entertainment world is not for me. A question, a, a decision, which I sometimes question because, you know, it would have been a very different lifestyle, right? Uh, yeah. But uh, and I went to join a startup, and 
basically our funding round, our, you know, so we had gotten some funding the first round and our second round was supposed to close on 915. Mm-hmm. And we had spent, I don't know, a good six months, nine months, you know, negotiating all these deals. We had the technology, you know, we're all this stuff. And our offices were in World Trade 7. So after 9-11, Everything's destroyed, you know, and even the 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 funding, the the, the venture capitalists, they were like, we don't know if we're going to be in business, right? So, yeah, I mean, all of a sudden, like, you know, you just go from, okay, we're about to, right, do this amazing, huge thing to, you know, oh, my God, like, none of us have jobs because the company just went under. But in a weird way, like, that didn't bother any of us, I think, in the first, you know, first 60, 90 days right after 9-11. Um, and I think, you know, if any of the listeners were in New York, New York City during those times, they'll remember, like, it was a very different environment. Like, none of us were actually concerned about it. All of a sudden, we were starting to be concerned about our like, families and friends and, you know, loved ones. You realize, God, I'm spending 12, 14 hours a day in the office. What for? Right? Because it could all just be taken away so quickly. So, yeah. So, it's uh, that's actually kind of why I think I ended up in real estate, right? Because... <laughs> After that, you know, I mean, the New York City economy, the startup economy, it was just, I mean, it, it just didn't exist, right? So I ended up doing all this different stuff, trying to find things to do and ended up um, working with a with a great company. I think they were sold called Kinesis Marketing. And one of our biggest clients was Realogy. Back then it was called Sendent. And we mm-hmm. had the Coldwell Banker account and we had the Coldwell Banker commercial account. So I started doing strategy work there, and one thing led to another. I went in house, and uh, all of a sudden, I'm like I'm in residential real estate. You know? uh, but before that, I was act- I started actually in commercial real estate, uh, doing uh, air- air- airplane hangers, <laughs> which was a really cool, that's, that's, cool that's business. Super specific, right? <laughs> Very specific. Uh, it was me and one other guy, uh, but he was a you know he was a big uh, he was a big player, you know, and. Uh, we we thought there was opportunity in in purchasing and converting airplane hangars at municipal airports, private aviation. So we spent, gosh, I don't know, a year, you know, trying to chase those deals. So I learned a little bit about that. I learned, I mean, it was just a fun time, you know. And then yeah. uh, I got into real estate, and here I am. Yeah. So 2009 is a big year for you. That's when you launch 7DS That's and right. Associates, right? Yep. 7DS Associates. So let's talk about, well, first of all, the name. I, yes. Now I got it from Sunny, so I do yeah. know. And yeah. uh, But the the what was the inspiration behind the name? And what is, uh, what's the DS stand for? Yeah, I get asked this. 7DS stands for Seven Deadly Sins. And it stems from a, a uh, post that I wrote, you know, like way back. Like one of the very first things I, I wrote. Uh, kind of about real estate online. And as an aside, I mean, I wanted to, like, I've always been a sort of blogger. I mean, when, when I left law school, right, you know, uh, and when, <laughs> yeah, this is another one, like I decided the lawyer life isn't for me because I don't like making 150000 a year as a 25-year-old, <laughs> right? And I took a job <laughs> as a magazine editor uh, in Seattle, right, making like 24000 I I can't remember. Okay. My parents mm-hmm. were like, you're going to do what now? Like, what? But, uh, you know, I, I was always involved in the internet, right? For And that's a whole other long story. And I knew HTML, so I started making websites. I was already involved in online discussions, whether it's politics or sci-fi or gaming or whatever. So when this when uh, this blogging thing came along, right, I think I was working at, at Sendit. And I remember going to my bosses, going to Realogy, you know, basically Sendit, Realogy, and saying, we should start doing blogs. We sh- you know, this is like a new thing. We should absolutely start doing this. And they came back with, the only way we're going to do this is if you pass every post through legal and PR. And I was like, you don't understand how blogging works. Right? <laughs> like, it, it doesn't work that way. It's, you know. So I didn't do it until 2009. You know, when I went off on my own, I said, okay, I can do my own thing. Uh, 2008, actually. But that's a whole chapter I want to forget. And one of the very first things I wrote was basically something called Seven Deadly Sins of Marketing. And it stemmed from this idea that I had that you can evaluate every business right, on the seven deadly sins. Right? Because the seven deadly sins, if you think about it, they're all things that are required. right? They're all things that are actually wonderful in moderation. So for example, greed. 
if you have no greed, you know, if you have no desire to make money to improve your lot, right? Then, then what you know, then you don't do anything, right? So, or lust, like lust is bad, but we all need to procreate. Like we need the next generation, you know, of of humans to come along. So what I realized was these are just incredibly powerful human urges that are so powerful that excess leads to problems. So the, the religions of the world essentially try to control the excess because they're such powerful urges. Right? So I thought from a marketing standpoint, you want to appeal to those fundamental human urges, right? Like sloth. Sloth is bad. You know, it's a sin, right? Being lazy. Yeah. Except that if you look at just about every technological improvement we've had, it's because we want things to be easier, right? Like nobody wants to wash their clothes down by the river, you know, with their hand. So we invent things like washing boards, which then lead to things like washing machines. You know what I mean? Like, so that that's why I, I uh, wrote that post. And as I was thinking about what I want to call my company, you know, my my when I started, I thought, you know, I would do marketing consulting. That's my background. You know, I would do product development. I would work with brokers. So I thought seven deadly sense. It makes sense. So 70s associates, you know, that that's where it comes from. Yeah. I love it. Your blog, Notorious ROB, which yes, by the way, it's just a great name. I mean, <laughs> to this day, it's still one of my favorite <laughs> names of a blog. Um, it says a lot about you, Rob. I'm just saying, you know, uh, so, so do your music choices. Yeah. Just go, just go make sure you're listening or following along. <laughs> so, but um, you, you love to write. I do. And, and and I think I've said this before. I'm I'm the biggest fanboy of of good writers, of copywriters, because mm -hmm. it is a skill and a talent that I think most people think they're good writers, but they're not. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, talk. I, I just a quick question for you about the process. I mean, yeah. A typical notorious ROB post is how many words? Two thousand? Like Four thousand? Probably three thousand. Three thousand yeah. words. How long does it take you to craft one of those? Uh, probably takes me about somewhere anywhere between an hour to two hours, depending on how much research I have to do. Okay. Yeah. So you, it's not, it's it, you're, that sounds quick to me. I guess that's, uh, yeah. I don't know if that's just me, but I, I yeah. thought you were going to have some other, some other number. No, I mean, because, okay. you know, so I'll, I'll let me back up one bit. Uh, I mean, I, I appreciate that you think I'm a good writer. You know, I, I don't, <laughs> I, <laughs> if I were a good writer, my post would be like 500 words, you know, that's, <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, okay. But yeah, I'm a writer. Like I've been writing since I was in, uh, since I was a teenager, like that's been my thing. So I feel like this is just an outlet for me. You know, I just need to write stuff. If I get serious about writing, then I'll experiment more Then I'll pay a lot more attention to like word choices and things like that. But for a blog, it's just more of a brain dump. You know, and it just kind of comes out. So, you know, my so my process there's very there's no editing, except although in the last two years, two, three years or so, I have this very capable editor, you know, that I'm married to, and she does <laughs> eyes on almost all of my posts, and then you know make some suggestions and whatnot. But so it it really is kind of like I'm just trying to tell a story, right? I'm just saying like here's something that I think, here's something that I notice, here's my take on it. Where it gets time consuming is if I have to go do a lot of research, right? right. And that is something that I, people have told me about that. Like I, it's just kind of sort of second nature, probably because of my law school background. Like I don't want to just state things without any backup. You know, like I, I think these things for a reason. You know, I think these things because of this, because something that I saw and I believe this to be true. And then I, I try to provide evidence for it. Again, it's again, it's probably a lot like a lawyer. You know, you don't just say, "Well, this is whatever," and here's like you, you actually have to provide some evidence. So I try to do that, and if that takes a while, then it then it takes longer, right? Then I have right. to actually go and track that stuff down and so on. But if it's just, you know, just a topic that I've been thinking about, or I see something and I just want to react to it, uh, it's either there or it's not. And if it's there, it comes out pretty quick. So. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've written like five, six thousand words, and it's been, be like an hour and a half, two hours. You know, I type fast. You know, <laughs> so that's great. Your primary clients, yeah, um, I shouldn't say primary. There, there's been a wide range of clients for you, whether it's yeah. associations or yeah. MLSs or yeah. brokerages, even startups, right? Startups, uh, large tech companies. You know, uh, yeah. Well, I look at any anyone that could afford my rates, really. Okay. I'm a consultant, which is just another way of saying unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, uh, of those, of those places, 
what's your favorite place to work in? Where do you really uh, get excited? So this is such a difficult question uh, in a way. It's a great question. I think my favorite – so they're all my favorites but for different reasons, right? So yeah. let me give you an example of what I mean. Like I love working with tech companies, right, because we're, they're filled with super smart people. Uh, they're nimble, uh, and uh, if if there's something really great, you know, as we come up with a strategy or product plan or whatever, and if it's good, then they can implement it and implement it fast. And in, in at least a couple cases, I, I frankly just can't talk about. But let's just say that I've personally seen where like a strategy that I've recommended has ended up completely changing the fortunes, you know, of the client, right? Uh, and it's a company you've all heard of, right? So I just I don't talk about it's like it's nobody's business, but you know, between them and, and me. Totally get it. Right. So that part's what's really great about working with tech companies. Okay. And that's the case whether it's the largest of the large or the smallest, you know, sub two man startup. What's but thing is like brokerages. I love working with brokerages because one of the reasons why I love this industry is that despite all of the, you know, some of the issues that we both know, I do feel like it's it's an industry that's just filled by really good people. You know, like, again, I came out of tech, I came out of law, and you get into real estate and like, you get clients that will write you handwritten thank you notes. You know, you, you, I go to conferences and I talk to real estate agents and brokers and yeah, you know, like every industry has has their assholes and, you know, it's uh, whatever, inflated egos and all that. But this one, it's just such great people, you know? And brokers, I love, I like working there because a lot of times the brokers, I, I, I mean, I don't know how else to put it. They're like salt of the earth people. You know what I mean? They're just, just the greatest men and women, you know, who kind of got into the business, uh, partly because, you know, they're like, hey, I'm building my practice. I, I want to be a broker. But a lot of it is because they really want to serve other people. They want to help agents be more successful. They want to help clients, right? So I love working with them for that reason, you know. Uh, the problem with them is a lot of them can't actually implement the strategies, right? Because, and this is something I've I've been talking about recently. Maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it because they don't have any capital, right? And their margins are just so trash that they just can't do it, you know? So they're having a tough time of trying to say, I need things to continue the way they have been for a while because I need to pay my bills. But I'm going to try to slowly switch. So it's it's frustrating that way. But I love working with brokers for that reason. MLS is I love working with because they're dealing with real pro- big problems, right? And they, they, the frustrating thing about working with them, so it's great to work with them because you know that you can have a huge impact, right? And I know that I'm right about a lot of the things, uh, you know, in terms of the strategy and direction and so on for MLSs and associations. The frustrating part is they're caught in this such a complex web, you know, of interests, you know, whether it's agents, brokers, associations, uh, you know, directors, uh, the government. I mean, there's just, it's very, very hard for them to do anything to change that. However, once in a while, you do find that that unique window or a unique group of leaders and they want to go forward. Like that, that's really fun then because then I know, you know, we're making a difference, right? Or we have a chance to make a difference. Um, so yeah, it's it's all for different reasons. But I guess from a, efficiency like efficacy standpoint it's the tech companies it's the private you know those guys um, quick and nimble right yeah you know from a human standpoint where i feel like i really could help the client like improve their lives i think it's brokerages and then from a sort of industry important standpoint it's likely the association of mls's but conversely they're the ones who have the toughest time executing anything they're the ones who have the toughest time you know trying to do any of the strategies I've had the opportunity to uh, interview a number of AEs or CEOs, right? Right. Uh, of associations. And that dynamic of having an all volunteer board that can change annually, yeah. completely control yeah. <laughs> the purse strings and yeah. some other things. That's yeah. that's what you're talking about, right? That's part of what I'm talking about. I mean, I've I think I'm on the record as saying that MLS governance is severely broken. And I've been involved in some projects to try and help change that. And it's very, very difficult to change, right? So as an example, the the wrote the revolving door, the one-year terms, it's not helpful. This is not how you want to govern a, a corporation, right? And a lot of these ML, larger MLSs are corporations. And then you have got things like, 
you know, there's no real requirement to be on a board of an MLS, right? I've, I've been in board meetings where the board, met, the directors would frankly claim, I don't know how to read a balance sheet, mm. right? And yeah, they don't, they don't, but their, their point is they didn't join the board in order to get involved in financial decisions. They joined the board so that they could control the realtor rules, you know, and, and on that, they're experts, right? So like, hey, how should we handle new construction listings in the MLS? Like, those are the people you want to go to. Like, these are men and women who are, you know, 30 years experience. Like, they're, they're the ones you want to do that. But you put a, you know, p and statement in front of them and they just glaze over, right? So it's, that's part of the problem. Then you've got, like, shareholders, which most MLSs are owned by realtor associations. And they have their own problems. And they don't want to see any change. And it just gets so complicated. But, I, yeah, I mean, as a result, I, I do worry about the MLS a lot. Because these are companies that are run like nonprofits, many cases are in fact nonprofit, but they're providing a business technology data service to business people, you know. And I that's that's just I don't I don't know how you do it, you know. I just don't know how you do it. I, th- I think I can get the answer to this question from from your blog, but yeah, you have a magic wand you can wave, yeah, and you get to build from scratch, yeah. An MLS association in an area relationship, what's it look like? Oh, gosh. I, so the problem with the magic wand analysis is you need network effect, right? Because that's what yeah. makes the MLS valuable. So saying we're going to start it from scratch to me is like then we have to replace all the ones that exist. And I don't know if that's even desirable, right? So let me, let, me, let me try and answer it sort of a little differently. What I would love to see the MLSs do, and all 550 of them, whatever, I would love to see all of them go private, right? not be not-for-profit. You know, All of them go private. And I've, I've been engaged in this whole privatization initiative since like 2010 and just start buying each other up right? and go raise capital because you can't go raise any money if you're a not-for-profit. You can't go raise any money if you're even if you're a for-profit MLSs, and there are a number of them. But your bylaws specifically state we're going to run as a nonprofit, right, for member benefit. <laughs> like right. nobody's giving you any money, right? So, I, I mean, I think I would love to see maybe three, you know, large MLSs, right, East, West, Central, uh, that have I don't know three hundred, four hundred thousand members each, because Zillow's worth like eleven billion. Right? And they have 90,000 agents. Right? I'm like, if we had three large MLSs, these are, these are publicly traded multi-billion dollar enterprises uh, that could actually then deliver the type of service and type of products and technology and innovation that I think the 21st century brokers and agents want and in some cases need, and they're just not getting it. Not because the MLSs don't want to deliver it. It's that you don't have any money. You, know, like, I, you just right. don't have any money. I remember the the initiative in Arizona to try and go to one yeah. statewide MLS. Yeah. And man, that's just seems like it's impossible. It, I, I don't know if it's impossible, but it's certainly unlikely. So my concern yeah. is this, and this isn't anything secret, it's something I've been talking about. Like, if you look at the general economy as a whole, right? I mean, we are getting to a larger, more national, more international, right? Um, economy as a whole, right? Yeah, there's an argument to be made that real estate is local, you know, and therefore uh, it's going to be the the mom and pop, right, in your small town that really knows the, like, I, I get all that, right? But just the way that the internet works, just the way that technology works, you know, um, like we're, we, we, we could never have, you know, 12 Googles, you know what I mean? It just doesn't work. Like we're going to have one, you know, maybe two. But cell phones, I, you know, yeah, you could have maybe three or four providers. You're not going to have 40. You know, it just doesn't work that way. So from that standpoint, if the MLS has continued to sort of go down this path, and we talk about like, consolidation has been a thing in that space for as long as I've been in it, right? Everyone's talking yeah. about consolidation. And what? So when I started in 2009, there were something like 800 plus MLSs. Now we're down to 550. So like, it's huge progress. I'm like, that's 20 years, yo. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Right. Like, oh, 10 years. It's a, you know, so on that, on that speed, what, by 2030, we'll be down to 350, right? But thing right. is, like, by 2030, we're potentially looking at things like 
Tesla with driverless cars or potentially, I mean, who the hell knows, right? The rest of the world is moving on. And so this is, this is the thing, I guess anybody that's listening, broker, agent, you know, MLS exec, board members, just say, fine, 20 years from now, in the year 2040, do you still see, let's call it 250 MLSs in the country? Do we still see that, right? I mean, do we still see that future? And if the answer is no, then, you know, you got to make some decisions, right? Like, if the answer is no, we think there's going to be one, two, three large, you know, national, international data networks, you know, then the question is, what are you doing about that? Where are you in that mix? And it's stuff that people don't want to think about. It's too big, you know, and... uh, and again, like when your term is one year, like what's your incentive right, to get involved right. with that? Right. So yeah, I'm, we're we're in the middle of the CBA bargaining with the NFL. You know, yeah. <laughs> think about that, right? There, yeah. There, there's that same. The players that the average lifespans four and a half years. Are they thinking, you know, ten years, fifteen years down the road? Right. No, of course not. not. So much. <laughs> and human beings, as a rule, like we don't do well with that. Right. right. Uh, and, and I think actually there's some value to that, right? Sort of the wisdom of the crowds approach things. And I'm not saying that like it's one, it's a great idea to have three MLS in the country. You know, I, I don't know that it's a good idea, right? All I'm saying is if it's things are headed that way and the rest of the economy, the, all the other industries, everybody's sort of moving in that direction, you know, like, okay, so what do you do about that? <laughs> You know, just like the the existence of nation, national brokerages is something that we have never really talked about, right? EXP is a single brokerage, right? You know, yep. Compass is a single brokerage. NRT is a single brokerage. Like when the MLS system was invested, I don't know that these things existed. And we had some franchises that were national, but right. the brokerages were not, right? Because technology yeah. scale, like it didn't, it just didn't really exist. Well, now it does. Right. And the needs of a national scope brokerage are completely different than the needs of the three person mom and pop. Right. And trying to reconcile that, it's tough. You know, it's tough enough without having to deal with I mean, 550 little, you know, fiefdoms. Right. So it's going to happen. And the only issue is, okay, what happens along the way? Right. That, that's the real question. Right? Yeah. Let me take you down another path yes, where. Sir. We want to know what's going to happen in the future. Okay. So, <laughs> Mr. Prognosticator. <laughs> Don't worry. We're, 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 oh, wait. We are recording this. Okay. We are, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and remember, my predictions are – my batting average is like below the Mendoza line. I just want to oh, point no, that out. Oh, no, that's not good. That's not good. <laughs> um, let's talk about the iBuyers. Because well, yeah. why not? Because everybody talks about them. Sure. But let's, sure. So from from the OG startups, right, like uh, yeah. Open Door and Offer Pad to yeah. Zillow – to yeah. the now the, the brokerages exp yeah. and yeah all of them yeah what 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 what's your response what what should agents be thinking about uh i think is my response number one there are only two true i buyers in the market right now i think it's just open door and zillow right now okay. everybody else they're not i buyers they're flippers and so as a result of the word i buyer being so tainted with that i've i've started using different words like hmm. they're market makers and then they're flippers and flipping has been around since, I don't know, like the beginning of real estate, right? <laughs> you know? yep. uh, I mean, I think you could argue that the deal for Manhattan was probably a flip, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, sure. right? The yeah. Louisiana purchase, I mean, we could maybe think of that as a flip, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We bought it for one price and then we sold it for, right? But uh, market making is different, right? And I think Open Door and Zillow right now are the only two market makers that are left. I don't, I no longer consider OfferPad or Redfin to be market makers. So, that's thing number one. Thing number two, then, as a result, in terms of what brokers and agents should think about, is no, no one really, I, I think, even now, right, uh, has really internalized that. So, and I think part of it is because the linguistic problem, part of it is the marketing spiel. Like Inman just had a thing, just had a post up about some. Quote, I buy a company in Long Island. I can't remember their name uh, right now. I can look it up on Inman, I'm sure. But when it talked about they're not interested in disrupting, right? But it turns out this company, they have a, they, their origin is a, a guy who has a lot of experience flipping houses. So they go and say, we're going to work with agents. We're going to work with brokers. And we're looking to buy properties at 12% below list. Like, 
that's not market making. You know, that's not what it is. So, and I think agents and that every every brokerage, you know, Redfin included, has these programs where like we're i buyers and we'll buy your house, you know, for cash. Yeah, at twenty percent below, you know, market, who wouldn't, right? So right. those are investors, those are flippers, and that's that's not going to fundamentally change the business. What is going to fundamentally change the business are the market makers. And I think Zillow is the best example of it because they talk about it. They're a public company. So I talk a lot about Zillow, not because I think Open Door is unimportant. Open Door is even bigger than Zillow. I think they're you know, super important. It's just that they're a private company. They don't tell us anything. You know, they don't release stats. They don't, right. they don't get an earnings call to talk about their philosophy. They just don't do those things. So as a result, I think Zillow um, becomes kind of the, the, the default you know, flag standard bearer for iBuyer for technology. And what they're making clear is they're not interested in making a lot of money on these trades. And I think that's how you got to look at it. They're functioning exactly like pork belly market makers or gold or petroleum. You know, they're buying at, you know, 99 cents and they're selling for a dollar. Right? I mean, and they're just trying to make this tiny little sliver and then just up the, the, uh, the amount of trades, up the volume. So they're really injecting liquidity. They want to get paid a little bit for it. Where they're re- where they're going to make all their money really is in mortgage. Right. So I said this from the start when Open Door came out in 2014. I remember writing some a post called like "Forest for the Trees: The Open Door Edition." I think is the title of it. Right. And I remember saying back then because people were freaked out about Open Door, if you remember, right? Oh, yeah. They just like, oh my god, these guys are going to get between us and the clients and blah. blah. And I was like, I don't think that's 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 you don't have anything to worry about. You know, because my take on Open Door from the start is this is not a real estate play. This is a mortgage play, right? Because the pain in the contemporary transaction is in the mortgage. That's that's really where the pain is. You know, like, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I've bought homes and sold homes, you know, like going shopping for a home is fun, right? You know, you go on Zillow, yeah. you go on whatever website and you're like, ooh, and then you look at the pictures and then you get in a car, you go to our house. It's a little annoying, but it's fun. You can try and imagine, oh, we could put the sofa here and that part's fun. Where things get significantly less fun is after the contract is signed, right? You have a contract for sale and then, and then you go into this 30, 60, 90 days of, you know, of the financial proctology exam. And, you know, like it, that's where things are really painful. And I think that's what Open Door set out to solve. I think that's what Zillow is trying to solve. And I think brokers and agents have not really thought about what do you do if we enter a market maker world, right? What does your job look like if we're in a market maker world? And homes don't take 30, 60, 90 days. They don't require staging. They're going to, they're, essentially people are going to buy and sell them within 48 hours using a market maker intermediary, right? And wow. people haven't thought that through. And I and I've I've already written you know dozens of posts about things to think through and here's what this shape could look like so and so forth. But in real estate, it's 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 transforming a little bit differently. Uh, so so I, so I guess because I know you know we don't have unlimited time. <laughs> I think the biggest thing for brokers and agents to think about is something that I I debuted in a presentation in Toronto uh, recently at the Ontario uh, event, which is. The combination of those two factors means that we are headed towards what I like to call super, uh, bionic super teams. Right? So, super teams have been around for you know at least decade, you know at least ten years before I got into the, the real estate industry. Right? I very distinctly remember back in I want to say like two thousand eight, two thousand seven timeframe. There was a super influential post that I read on. I don't know if those guys are still active. The Bloodhound blog. Yeah, remember those I don't guys? think that's. As active as it was, but yeah, they're on Phoenix. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it mm-hmm. was because uh, Phoenix is the birthplace of the super team, right? Yep. And uh, one of the guys wrote about the super team and how it functions and so on. And I remember reading that, going, "Holy crap!" Right? Like this is this is incredible. And then, and then I run across Millionaire Real Estate Agent, right? And Gary Keller's in you know, a seminal book. And to me, Gary Keller's a first ballot Hall of Famer in real estate because of that book. So these sort of brokerages within brokerages, you know, the seven, whatever, seventh level, all of that stuff, like it's taken that time, right, for it to become mainstream, but it's now mainstream. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know how many top producing agents in the industry now are not, you know, team owners 
right. think they all are, right? If or they're if not, not, they want to be, right? Correct. If <laughs> yeah. not, they, yeah. they want to be, they're on their way, they've been planning it, right? The, the issue is once you add kind of what's happening with the market maker model and technology and so on, these teams are going to completely dominate the industry in ways that we've never seen, right? So I don't know if you're still in Phoenix. But are you are you in that area? I'm actually I'm actually now in St. Petersburg, Florida. Okay, with the, we're still with the FNF family, but over here right. now. So yeah. so still hot, but much more humid. Um, yeah, yeah. But like Phoenix, people don't talk about this very much, but I believe that the Zillow offers front man, you know, the Lawton team out there. Yeah. I think there's a really decent chance that that team potentially did two and a half to three billion dollars in volume last year. If that was a brokerage, they would be on the S the uh the you know Swanapool Mega 1000, they would be on the Real Trends 500. I mean they're that would be a big, big brokerage. Right? And that's a team. And you know, and I think from an agent standpoint, the idea is well technology will never replace us, right? You know, oh yeah, these uh these whatever I buyers, they they can't get between me and my client. I'm like, that's true, right? But George Lawton can get can get between you and your client because he's just as experienced as you are, except that he has a large team that's well run and he's got the technology, he's got he's got the money, he's got it all. What makes you think you could compete against that guy? And if the idea is what, well, because I've known my client for twenty years, okay, you know that's fair. I totally get that. My take on that is we'll see how that plays out because even if I've known a realtor for twenty years and I like my realtor. I like my kids way more than I like my realtor, right? And the minute it becomes easier or less expensive for me to deal with, you know, somebody else, you know, guess what, right? Like that's yeah. how I look at it. That's how I look at it. Interesting, yeah. Interesting. So I think the thing that brokers and agents have not yet come to terms with is where are you on the bionic super team curve, right? Where are you? Because I'm telling you right now, there are dozens of teams that are already on on this thing. You know, they're pioneers. They're really on the front edge of that. And those guys are capturing market share like you can't believe, right? And nobody's tracking this. Nobody's tracking this. Mm. <laughs> now, is, there, is there a concern or do you think this is possible that uh, there's going to be this weird uh, cyclone effect or it's going to continue to spin where the team gets to a certain size and says, "Oh, it's a it's an ego play. I need to I need to be a brokerage," and they they turn into a boutique brokerage. They, I mean, it's possible. A lot of them do yeah. that, right? Um, and yeah. the thing that I have to point out to people is that you know the whole brokerage concept is just legal, right? It's just state law. Okay, right. well, I know teams that have gone out and hired a broker on salary, right? Because right? they just need somebody to have the broker's license, but that broker, the agent, does not work for that broker. It's the and other it's, way around. It's, it's still right. a team. It's just disguised as a broker. Yeah, exactly. In a way. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And like it, it just ultimately comes down to who controls the leads. It comes down to that. In a team situation, yep. the team controls the leads. In a broker situation, the agent controls the leads. So brokers are getting their ask like, I mean, their their financials are awful. Whereas team financials are unbelievable. I, I, I talked to a team leader at Inman. Blew my mind because I up until that point I had been assuming that teams are on 50-50 splits, right, with their team members. Sure. He's like, no, I'm on thirty-five sixty-five. His agents are thirty-five percent. Wow. Right, and if, if they don't like it, there's the door. I got two hundred other people who come in here and gladly take thirty-five percent of two million dollars. You know what I mean? Like. Right, you know, uh, yeah. brokers will say stuff like that, but they can't enforce any of it because they don't generate any of the business. Whereas a team could say, "I've got two hundred leads. Do you want any of it?" Right, right. you get thirty five percent. I mean, that's that's the reality. And then now, like I said, you add on advanced technology, the uh, the the sort of market maker phenomenon, and, and all of that, and you know, so the thought experiment that I did in 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 Canada and freaked them out is. One of the things to keep in mind is that real estate is a zero sum game, right? You know, for the past 10 years, like, you know, we've had roughly five and a half million homes sold every year, right? Mm -hmm. And here's the thing none of us in the industry, none of us control that, right? Like, right. housing is entirely macroeconomics, it's entirely jobs, interest rates, global trade. You know, it's stuff that none of us control. Which means that when one of these teams goes and doubles their production, 
in that local market means some other agent lost a bunch of deals, right? Because there's only yeah. a certain number of deals in a given area. Yeah. yeah. So I look at that and go, okay, well, the, what the future then looks like is to me, and I don't know what the number is, but I, what I did say was, look, so five and a half million homes sold, that's 11 million sites. Okay. I'm fairly certain that the Lawton team, for example, probably did something in the order of 3,500 transactions last year. Okay. And they can keep growing. Right. So how many teams do we actually need to handle 11 million transactions? The answer comes out to roughly 3,000. So here's the second question. How many brokers do 3,000 teams need? Right. Well, in a minimum one. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. How many MLSs right. do 3,000 teams need? How many yeah. associations do 3,000 teams need? Yeah. And it's it's this is the kind of stuff where my head goes and I think why people hate talking to me sometimes <laughs> cuz my mind goes there and they're like you're crazy, you're so extreme. I'm like you're right. I am, you know, but that's just logical where it goes. Maybe we don't get to that point, right? Maybe it's not 3,000, maybe it's 30,000. But let's ask the same question. How many brokerages do 30,000 super teams need? How many MLS do 30,000 super teams need? And if those guys are doing 90% of the transactions, so that's a typical rule, right? The 90-10 rule. If those guys are doing 90% of transactions, what do the other 1 point whatever, 3, 2 million realtors do? And as an agent, then I have to think about where am I on that curve, right? Am, mm-hmm. I, am I on the way up where I'm going to form one of these teams? Am I... Do I not care about any of that? Like you, you got to make some decisions, and it's really hard, and it's really, it's really painful to think about, and it's really troubling, and you know, and I'm like, but from a strategy standpoint, that's where you got to think. Yeah, that's what you have to think about. I know, probably not your happiest podcast of the year, Bill. No, <laughs> I wish I could just come on and say, look, it's all about, it's all about recruiting and retention. Just keep recruiting, and you'll be fine. Like I, I wish I could do that. <laughs> all right, Rob. So. I want to thank you very much for uplifting all the spirits of the agents <laughs> listening to, to the podcast, first of all. Oh, wait, hold on. Actually, you know what? Let me do this. Okay. Having said that, right? think about it. In this type of change, if you are one of those 3,000 or 30,000, right? So if you don't panic, you don't freak out, you go, oh, wait a minute. There's massive disruption changing. I'm going to take advantage of it and you get better. Oh, my God. The rewards for the winners are going to be unreal. Right. Unreal. So yeah. in a way, yeah, it's it's I mean, that's the only sort of note of optimism I think I can take is if you're if you have any sort of sense of risk and entrepreneurship, now is the time to really think about that. Right. Because if yeah. you win, the rewards are unbelievable. If you lose, then, yeah, then it sucks. But that's kind of the way it is in, in business. If, if you know, it, it sucks to lose. <laughs> so there's that. So yeah. I will say this is. This is going to be an awkward question, Rob, because it's the same final question I ask every guest on the show. But sure. after that, after that, um, look into the future. It's going to have a different feel. So, right. if you could give one piece of advice to a new agent just starting, yeah. what would it be? Ah, uh, uh, join a team. <laughs> I, I thought you would go there. Yeah, join yeah. a team. Not, not, not because join a join a really good team. Learn how they do it. And if you decide, you know, after a few years, right, okay, you know, I've got the right temperament, I've got the capital, I've got the moxie, I've got the, I've got what it takes, then you know how to do it, right? So uh, that's how great companies are formed. You know, they come out of other great companies, you know, uh, whether it's banks or law firms or, you know, pizzerias, you know, or restaurants. And to be frank, and I think this is the way we're going to head is, the teams themselves, the existing teams will start to see that there's a lot of value in training their people to eventually go independent, right? to eventually become a fierce competitor, actually, because you are going to want that right, so that you can get better. right? And if you have those relationships, who knows? Maybe there's an acquisition play. Maybe there's something down the road. But I think, I think what we're going to see is something much more like an apprentice type system, which I think is good for everybody. Uh, but if you're a brand new agent in the business today, I would say go find a really great team in your area and join it. Learn all you can. I suck up all that experience, all that knowledge, and then make some decisions at that point. 
Rob, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, gosh, they can find me on Facebook. They can find me on Twitter. Although I don't, I'm not super active on Twitter these days. Email works for me. Uh, Arhan at 7DS Associates. And quite frankly, just go to the blog, right? Yeah. You know, Leave or, a comment, right? I know, you, comment. I know you read them. I know I you reply. Read comment. Nobody comments. Very few people comment. Um, hmm. You know, and but if you want to chat with me for whatever reason, probably want to check out like some of my ideas around around this. Um, yeah, you know, and I do have a subscription service on the blog, which they're welcome to do it if they, it, it's not required. I mean, I frankly have it so that I know who the real serious people are, right? Because yeah, you know, sense. I'll put up blog posts and I'll get like four hundred comments, and three hundred ninety of them won't be you know won't be that educated. I'm like, you don't read very often. You just came in here to spout whatever company line um right that's not useful for anybody not not just me for anybody else reading um but yeah i would say you know check out the blog notorious How about Rob. uh you have a podcast as well you and greg still partnering up we, yeah we still do that when we can you know uh, we have we, we have day jobs we can't do it like it's really hard for us to coordinate <laughs> and the name of that uh, one for everybody the name of that one is industry relations uh yeah. you can find it on apple you can find it on on the Android, what Google's Play Store Google podcast now, yeah. Right. Um, and then, yeah, we need to do a, a little bit better job of of uh, doing that more regularly. I do a podcast on my site, you know, once in a while where I interview people. Um, so yeah, they, they they can find me if they want me. <laughs> Excellent, Rob. I, I thank you so much for your time today. It really, you know, I I love how deep you think about some of these things that others just kind of gloss over, especially at a conference or, you know, in, in their uh, missives online. Right. No, I so, appreciate that. Yeah. I, I would like, I would imagine you and Sam to board at a dinner would be a ton of fun. You know, and Sam and I do try to get together for dinner at, at a lot of these industry events and yeah. it is a lot of fun. He's a That's very, awesome. very smart guy. You know, he's a very deep thinker. Um, and yeah, no, Sam's one of my favorites. And uh, thank you for having me on Bill. This was, this was fun. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Sessions podcast. To leave a review or rating, go to ratethispodcast.com slash RE Sessions. You can also subscribe to the podcast at your favorite podcast listening app. Finally, you can go to the realestatesessions.com and subscribe to our email newsletter and be notified whenever a new episode is released.